Alright. Hey everybody, welcome to another great edition of the Frankie Slauson Show and my summer interview series, Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture. And today we get very iconic today. I have with me the lead singer of the 70s group, Wild Cherry, Mr. Rob Parisi. How's it going? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing great. Uh, this is uh, a, an honor to be able to chat with uh, somebody of your legendary status. It's nice to be uh, chatted with. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been kind of I've been kind of following some of your posts uh, r recently on Facebook. Some of your uh, humorous uh, posts that you've uh, been uh, putting up there. I, I like that. <laughs> I have lots of good friends that I grew up with, and uh, from my hometown, and they're on uh, my site, and uh, we just keep kidding around like we did when we were in school. Oh, okay, okay. So you were more like a, a, a joker back in those days. I yeah. was a class clown with the rest of my crazy friends, and we all had a good time in school, and we just found each other uh, on Facebook, which is good. <laughs> so we just keep up the craziness. Uh, is you know, only bumped up about 50 years with more experience. God Almighty, how dangerous could that be? Yeah, imagine if Facebook would have been around 50 years ago. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> If Facebook would have been around when we were in high school, we would have probably, half of us would have been in prison by now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. But, uh, yeah. But, yeah. You know, sometimes the social media can uh, breed insanity. Yeah, you know? sometimes. Sometimes. It makes, makes crazier people crazier. It just, it's just nice, uh, just nice to have something uh, around where you can actually find people. Like, if it wasn't for social media, I don't think I'd be doing this interview show. I can tell you well, that. You know, much. I, I did radio for a while, morning radio, yep. and um, I've always been an early riser, anyhow. But one of the best things, and the best thing I have to say about doing morning radio, though, I'd still be doing it actually if, uh, if my life t took a different turn. But I would say that just getting up in the morning and reading three newspapers and coming up with some crazy stuff that people did overnight that you can make fun of and and have some, without destroying anybody, yeah. but you can just make fun of the events of the day, no matter what they will be, and then communicate with people when they call in. You talk about it. I mean, some people call in and give you, you could come up with something good and somebody will call in and they'll give you something even better to think about. Oh, you know? wow. Oh, wow. What uh, what radio uh, station did you work for? I worked for a uh, rock station in Wheeling, West Virginia. It was about 22 miles away from where I came from uh, in uh, Mingo Junction, Ohio, which is very uh, three, town, uh, three miles south of Steubenville, a town on the Ohio River. Okay. Uh, West Virginia is right across the river from us. Uh, was this after you did the Wild Cherries uh, group, or was it yes, before? Yes, you know what, uh, Wild Cherry, we uh, had played that funky music, and uh, I went to New York for a while after that, and then my parents, they were getting older, and I came home, and um, I put a band together and worked with some guys in the meantime, and uh, then I just uh, met someone before I got married, I just got out of playing so much because it was something that didn't really make a lot of money. Okay. And I got back into um, something that could, and radio was a, uh, something that I could uh, advance in. Yeah. If, if you get the morning spot, you can do very, very well. So that's what I did. I, I was in radio for maybe a month before I got offered to do mornings. It was a good thing for me. I was oh. very lucky. Well, that's kind of cool, though, I mean, because... Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I got to become program director and uh, stuff within a year, wow. and I learned all the facets of doing morning uh, radio and uh, being a program director. And you can know music and be a, a musician, but that doesn't mean that you know radio. So yeah. it was good to learn the other side of it. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and I'm sure when you did it, you know, when you were a radio DJ, see, this is something that I'm kind of envious of because I never had a chance to... When I was a DJ for my, or for the college station that I worked for where I got all my experience from, uh, we all went digital then. You know, I didn't have the the, the chance to work with like uh, commercial carts or anything like that. Like I'm sure you did back in the day. And you're lucky. <laughs> I'm telling you something. You put on a piece of vinyl, and if it sticks, you're stuck, dude. <laughs> I mean, you better come up with plan, you know, plan B real quick. I mean, you're scrambling to find something. Oh yeah. To put on it. How? Yeah, I mean, if the CD sticks, because uh... <laughs> yeah, 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 if it freezes or whatever, yeah, I, 
now we everything's all computerized. It's all different, and and I think uh, like uh, a guy that I know who did radio, who I interviewed. Uh, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with his work, but uh, his name was Lee Marshall. He's the current uh, uh, he's the current uh, voice for Tony the Tiger for Frosted Flakes, and he is well known not just for his time in professional wrestling as an announcer, but also uh, as a radio DJ. And uh, he kind of says this is kind of a true story. It's like. Uh, Back in the day when you did a, sh- uh, a, a shift, you basically did a show. Nowadays, when people do a show or a shift, it's a shift, pretty much. Is that yeah. true? Well, the thing is, is um, you just have a certain time that you're given allowed to say what you want to say. Yeah. And you don't have to do all the other stuff, which back in the day, we had to do <laughs> all that stuff. Yeah. Then after our, our uh, shift was over, we had to go in and... I cut tape. I knew how to cut tape because I'd been making records for a long time. Yeah. So I knew how to splice tape and stuff like that. So when I was doing bits in the morning, I you know I could like hammer tape to death. And then at station we had carts, and I knew how to rebuild carts. So I just b- rebuild all the carts for the station. They were talking about the carts were weak, and I said, well, yeah, I can rebuild them. I just ordered the parts and rebuilt them. Oh. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, we, that's how we had to do it back then. I mean, yeah. You want to take a. You, when you wanted to take, take a first verse out of a song, you had to cut tape. Yep. And, and then you had to lay it on the couch, and when you wanted to put it back in, you had to cut another piece of tape, put that back in, and then wow. pick up again, you know? And nowadays, and nowadays, if you were going to do that today, it would just be all on the computer. <laughs> you can do it on computer. As a matter of fact, not only can you see that whole wave file in front of you go all the way past of everything that you recorded, but you can quantize it down to 16, 36, 64, tenths of thirds of 64 to find the right exact place that you want to splice something. And, uh, you know, all you got to do is know the math of where to, you know, to, to do things. And it's easy. You don't have to cut tape anymore. And I cut totally... Cut and splice. Cut and splice. I totally sucked at math, so I guess uh, I, I would have been worthless back in those days. <laughs> well, if I had to... See, what we did back in the day was you just find a snare drum crack. Oh. And you tag up that snare drum crack. Huh. When you want to splice in again. Huh. Yes, I mean, you just go by that. And there's the head that plays and the head that records. Yeah. And as long as you know where the play is, then you get that crack right there at the end of it, and then that's, you know, or the beginning of it, whatever you want. And then whatever you put in there, make sure it tags up with a snare drum crack, right. you know? Yeah, there was a show that was out back in those days, too, called WKRP in Cincinnati, and I think that was one of the shows that was, like, for any radio DJ or anybody that wanted to be a DJ, especially back in those days, I think that was that show was more or less inspiring than, than just a show. Yeah. Well, it was a, a show about a, a radio uh, life, and, and it's funny because there's a lot of things in that life that, just like any other business, you know, it's yeah. just like anything. Even rock bands are the same way. you got... Uh, personalities and dealing and um, with them and getting getting a group to, to do a certain thing together, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I tell you what, I mean, this is uh, this is pretty cool, you know, just the, ch- the chance of, of talking with a legendary guy who uh, was in charge of Wild Cherry, and uh, I'd like to know, uh, like, in your early beginnings, like, before you became a DJ and all that, what was life like for you growing up? I grew up uh, in a very small steel mill town. My dad was a diesel mechanic in a steel mill, and um, I just grew up uh, with an older sister that liked rock and roll records. She was in high school when I was about five, and um, she used to bring home Buddy Holly and uh, all the early bands like that, When rock, Bill Haley, when rock and roll first sure. started. She's 10 years older than I am. So I just got inspired. She would bring her girlfriends home. They would dance around in the kitchen, and I just loved that music. You know, I said, "Wow, this is cool." But I never knew what I wanted to do until maybe I was like ten, eleven, twelve. Then I started saying, "Well, I've seen this enough, and I'd like to do it." So I started to uh, get interested, and I bought the guitar, learned how to play. As time went on, by the time 1964 came along, the Beatles came out. Uh-huh. And that's when I said, oh, you should get in the band because this is how you get girls and all that stuff, you know. But yeah. that's what we did. We all got good, uh, the guys that wanted to be musicians. And um, the main thing to do was to, to uh, play music that uh, people loved, you know, especially girls, if they loved those things. Okay. So that's what I think inspires all boys. That inspired Billy Joel, other people too. Everybody gets into it like that. And I did. I, you have your, uh, but you have to spend the time practicing. 
So I practiced and I had influences, and my influences were everybody from Tchaikovsky to um, Cal Jader. Uh, he was like the, one of the kings of new wave jazz, actually. Oh, Henry wow. Mancini, Nelson Riddle. I mean, I got into all kind of music. I was like a sponge in California surf music. And from then, I just, uh, you know, went on to, to do different things. Played uh, in a band. I met uh, Bobby Denton. We had a good band, and he uh, he introduced me to uh, people in the Brill Building, which is a very famous music building in New York City. Huh. And um, he introduced us. He took us. He it was good about him because he could take my band right to Inton to some of the people that he knew would help us. And we met a lot of uh, pretty hit dudes. And uh, I had a chance to work out of that building in different uh, capacities with different people. It was always an outlet. And then I uh, come back home, put a band together, uh, and finally, while the cherry formed, and we were together two, three years. We uh, were so popular uh, with the lineup that we had that um, we could play as many days as a week as we wanted to. And then that band decided they wanted to go somewhere else. Uh -huh. And they wanted to form their own band. So I went and worked for some friends of mine for about three months uh, that were in the restaurant business and to manage your training. And um, I was selling my gear because I just was going to stop oh, sure. altogether. And uh, I had some guys from Pittsburgh coming down to look at the gear that I was selling. And um, all the time that they would say, why will you, why, why you, you know, why are you not playing? What happened to Wild Cherry? And I said, well, you know, they want to form their own band and I'm just out of here, you know, for a time being. And they said, man, if you ever want to put a band together, let me know. And I would listen to them play. And I was saying, I don't even know this guy. He's played so good, you know. <laughs> So finally, I uh, got fed up with where I was uh, doing with me. It was fun, uh, and I had some good friends that hired me. But I just said I can't make as much. I could make more money in a week to, uh, than I can here in two weeks. And I'm driving 100 miles back and forth every day. You know? Yeah. So I uh, put the band together with these guys that were looking at my gear, and then we had a, a rehearsals and auditions and... We hired uh, the bass player and the guitar player knew the drummer, and then the way it worked out, within six months, after I finally got a group together that was uh, happening, we uh, I wrote played that funky music. Within another six months after that, we had a record deal with CBS, and the song was coming out. Oh, wow. But it, uh, everything happened within a year. Jeez. Uh, well, that was, you know, now that looking back, I mean, that was pretty fast, but I didn't have any other choice at that time. <clears throat> sure. I either had to get it together and move it along really quick, or we were not going to make it, because the transition was going from rock and roll clubs close down to discos opening up. Yeah. And did you ever thought that you were just going to be doing, like, uh, funky type of music? I mean, because I... No. Because you're, oh, you're, 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 yeah, you're more, yeah, yeah, you're more. Because I, I always thought you'd be more like a rock and roller since you're, since you're saying how much you love that type of music and everything. You know. Well, the thing was is that's the kind of band that we were. Yeah. Initially, we were a rock and roll dance band, and what I mean by that is like Ocean by Zeppelin. Yeah. That's a rock and song. Uh huh. Songs like uh, Honky Tonk Woman by the Stones at that time. Sure. Give me shelter. They were R&B rock and roll tunes. Even Beatles come together. You know, that's something, I mean, all you gotta do is uh, do that kind of thing, and you'll get the, those girls to come in that club if they like rock, or, if they like rock, they're gonna be there, because they can dance. Girls yeah. dance with, you know, girls will dance with each other. So that's what we are, you know, that's what we always try to do, is get that kind of crowd of girls in there, and then the guys would be there, even if they, you know, they if the girls wanted to do the polka, guys would be there at ten fifteen to buy them drinks. Okay. As long as you had the club filled with girls, so that was our our forte to uh, to do that kind of thing. And um, you know, it just evolved from that point. Did you? That's uh, where it always came from. It was a rock and roll band. Oh sure. When I wrote "Play That Funky Music," we were doing the same kind of thing. Only we were doing like um, KC's tune. That's the way I like it. Uh huh. But we were rocking the damn thing out. I mean, it was not, like, uh, pretty. We were just, like, you know, it had the parts in there, but it sounded grindier. I mean, it was a little rougher. It wasn't so clean, you know? 
So, uh, when, when you write all these songs, uh, and, and, like, say you do it for an album and stuff, uh, how, how do you know that a certain song's going to be a hit for you? Well, you don't. Well, you have to trust your gut a lot of times. And, and what you do is, um, the more that I go along and the longer that I've been here, it takes me to write maybe, uh, sometimes I write every day because I, I, I'm used to writing uh, from those people from the real building. They just went to work and wrote every day. Uh -huh. And if you're a writer, you just write every day. So sometimes I might have 40 songs and I might pick 10 from those. Oh, yeah. But I mean, the 10 that I pick from those, if, if that's what it is. And even I might pick six or seven out of those 40 and say, yeah, these six are good, but you know what? I don't have anything. I, I want, maybe I want to write four more songs. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. You just write until you feel that you have something strong enough to represent where you're coming from at that point, you know? Oh, so you get to pick the hit song. I thought a company would pick the hit song or like a studio or something like that. Well, you know what? Sometimes you can be... Um, if you have good people around you, God bless. I mean, that's wonderful because they could be saying, hey, listen, I've been listening to those 10 tunes. Yeah. And I hear this song here. And then you listen to it with them and they say, see what I'm talking about? Or they say, you know, uh -huh. I mean, sometimes somebody can turn you on to something. Like, <laughs> play that funky music. I know how big that song was going to be. Yeah. I wish I could say that I did, but I did not. <laughs> And, you know, it surprised me more than it surprised everybody as it was going up. It was like, holy crap, you know? Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I recorded that song to be a B-side. It was not supposed to be the A-side. Yeah, because there's a song uh, I was listening to that uh, that you guys also sang called Don't Go In The Water, I believe. I think it's called Don't I Go In The Water. <laughs> yeah. I wrote that song. Yeah, and I, I, I really liked that, you know, a little bit more than the Play The Funky Music, to be honest with you. <laughs> Well, you know, a lot of people like the different songs, and I feel um, very happy about that. There's one friend that I have, I he knows so much about my material that I told him the first six months that I knew him that I thought he might be a serial killer. Because, I mean, we hadn't. I mean, we were like one-hit wonders. Meanwhile, this guy's telling me about these obscure tracks on our albums, and I'm like saying, dude, I don't know, I'm scared. But anyhow, it's kind of cool, though, because people have mentioned different songs they like, and that's good. I'm glad. Yeah, it's just that it's just too bad you can't hear them on the radio unless you know somebody that uh, you can tip off that could probably play it on the radio for you or something. <laughs> well, you know, there are several bands that, that I even loved over the years when I grew up, and I, there were some album cuts that I really liked. You don't hear them on the radio all the time. You yeah. Know? I mean, it's good, though, that they're good songs, though. I think that's good. I mean, Bruce Springsteen, I worked with Gary Bonds, and we, uh, I know where Bruce works, and, you know, it's nothing for him to write 40, 50 songs to come up with. I mean, him and Steve go over things all the time. Jeez. Yeah, we got critical. I mean, and it's good. Elton John put off the release of his new album because he just changed the name in the meantime, and then all of a sudden he nicked some tunes and he wanted to write some more. I mean, but he got like this gigantic stack of lyrics from Bernie, which is great. I mean, if you got somebody like Bernie Toppin writing like a stack of lyrics that you just have to go through. But Elton writes great music to those songs. But anyhow, the point yeah. was he took time off. He did what he's supposed to do. He changed. You, you just don't release until you feel like it's time after a while you get more power to do that so how does a how does a band like the beatles or rolling stones uh you know become so successful that you guys just are the one hit wonders and you and you do everything that they did so how does that how how does how do no, they become a, more it's successful song quality sean i mean okay. I, the songs weren't as good as beatles songs oh okay <laughs> i mean that's a bottom line i mean that's it you know Oh, so even though you kind of did the same thing that they kind of did, and yet that they come from a different country, and then all of a sudden they're like, you know, these big no, guys. it's not <laughs> that they came from a different country. They're just more talented. Wow. And you never thought you were as talented as the Beatles? I'm talented, but I don't think I'm that. You know, I mean, obviously, I'm not McCartney. You know, I don't even claim to be. God I'm, Almighty. You know, it's all, the, it's all the same people on the charts all the time that are trying there. I mean, the yeah. ones that are doing the work that it is like getting over I mean gosh how could you even compare yourself to to me I, I just can't even think of comparing I mean well, know, anybody that says they can they're a fool you know? I, I, I think of that just because you know I always believe in, in, in the better the better half more or less that I believe that if you're an underdog and you're trying to make it and you're trying to be as successful as you can be that you want to try to be better than, than the opposite you know in a way. You try, you can. Yeah. I mean, look at Donald Fagan. I mean, he's an incredible musician. 
I mean, there are so many incredible musicians, but I mean, has he had the success that the Beatles have had? No. <laughs> that doesn't take anything away from him, you know? Yeah. But Joni Mitchell, I mean, gosh. Hey, the list uh, is thick. Yeah. Even Hendrix. Even Hendrix. <laughs> Cole, go back to Cole Porter. Go back to Mozart. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's cool. I mean, uh, and and uh, today, believe it or not, I don't know if I, I don't think I told you this or not, but uh, I actually had the chance to talk to somebody that you actually worked with uh, uh -huh. in Wild Cherry, uh, Mr. Donny Iris. Uh huh. I talked to him yesterday, and uh, we uh, we uh, chatted about you a little bit. <laughs> Good. He was, he was quite Good. he was quite uh, surprised too that I was able to talk to you and that he was able to talk to me and you know, blah blah blah. It kind of just kind of worked. I wish I could have got you guys together. That would have been kind of cool. <laughs> Donnie uh, was in a group called the Jaggers, and they were great. I mean, gosh almighty, there was nobody better than them. And then Donnie, uh, I, I was cutting my third album. I met, uh, he was a substitute engineer that yep. night. And I was thinking about making some changes in the band anyway. And when the engineer told me that he had to leave, I was bummed out because we were going overtime. And he said, don't worry, I've got Donnie Iris. I said, wait, Donnie, he's coming in here? I said, yeah. He said, what's he doing? He said, he's, engineer, he's a part-time engineer. So by the time Donnie came there, we started working, and all the time that he was there, I was saying, hey, listen, what are you doing? I ain't doing too much. Okay, you know what? You need to be in a band. And so that's what I did. I got him in a wild cherry, and... Um, we had a great time at a great, uh, you know, little adventure there, and then the band broke up because I was going through uh, legal problems with my record company, uh -huh. trying to get out of a contract, and Donnie ended up, and Mark, uh, the keyboard player, they stayed with the record company, and they had a nice run again on what they did. They, yeah. they uh, Donnie had Aliyah, he did, you know, he had some good songs, that was good. Well, I but just, he's good, Donnie's yeah. great, I mean, he's... That's why I had him or with me. I mean, he's, you know, <laughs> and it probably helped his career too. Uh, after being with you, you know, well, you inspired. know, whatever. But I'm saying, I, you know, you listen. Sometimes it just doesn't come. You, know, you just put people in a band, whatever. Help. If they got talent, you're right. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and in his case, yeah, I was right. That's why I got him in a band. You know, because he could help us, and he did right away. Oh wow! And oh. we did the rapper. You know, we added that to our set. Yeah. That's a cool tune, man. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I've listened to it a few times. Uh, uh, getting prepared for you guys, both you guys' interviews. I've been listening to a lot of your music, and, and even the B side stuff, you know, just to get prepared because that's what uh, I think a professional interviewer should do. And I'm just uh, a 29 year old kid from Minnesota that uh, doing this for free. So you know. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. That, uh, the song, the rapper that they had back then, it was number one and uh, on a couple national charts. Yeah. Yep. It wasn't one, number one, it was number two. Oh, wow. And it was with some big songs that year that were also number one. It was a good year for music, you know. And uh, they did very well out there. But that band, as far as, like, seeing them live, they sang like canaries, and they were incredible. They had, like, three lead singers, and the other backup singer had a range that was incredibly high. Oh, yeah. And they, they uh, did their homework and worked up all their songs. And when they were in town that night... You were going to have a hard time drawing a crowd. Oh, sure. But Donnie was one of the keys in that band. I mean, he sang his little buns off from the time he was a youngster. You know. And I suppose once you get so good at it, you know, it's like it's, it's so it, it makes it easier for you because once you've had the practice, you you can you know you're not you're not nervous anymore. You're. You just go out there and sing the best you can and uh, hope that people will still like you after the rest of after the night's over. <laughs> you know, there are people that are born as olds, yep. and Michael Jackson was one of them, is <laughs> a yeah, typical yeah. example. But um, Donnie uh, had that quality, too. He was pretty much born an old soul. And you're lucky if you have that, because you, you have an adaptation to um, pick up things easy. Sure. You know, having soul is not too hard to understand <laughs> <You know? laughs> somebody said one time you have to live a cup full of life in order to sing a teaspoonful of blues oh wow <laughs> that's Donnie, uh, pos Donnie possesses that he yeah that. that's a that's a good sign yeah. so other than uh, being a radio DJ what have you been up to lately 
Anything big I at all? Couple, I had a couple smooth jazz com, uh, albums, uh, CDs, and uh, they did pretty well. I worked with some really good guys from Spyro Jara, uh, Steve Oliver, who's an incredible guitar player, has had several smooth jazz hits, and uh, Will Donato, Zach's player, Kenny Blake from Pittsburgh. We did um, Tom Schumann and Bonnie Bonaparte from Spyro Jara. They did great. And we uh, put an album together, the, the second album that I did, they were all on it with me. And if we had fun, oh. we did pretty good on the Smooth Jazz charts. And then after that, I decided to do another vocal album, Smooth Jazz, all instrumental. <laughs> I decided to do a vocal album, and I have a current album called The Real Deal, and there's a song off of it called Right Beside You that's doing pretty good out there in the secondary radio market. It's number seven. Yeah, so it's doing okay. So is that kind of a difference for you now from uh, from what you used to play to what you're doing now? No, I've just been on my own track. I mean, after a while in life, you get to be able to do what you want to do. Yeah. And you, and you start your own record company, which I did, and you hire your own promotion people, which I did. And um, you just put something out there and see if it's got anything, if it can go anywhere. And you get, you're going to get radio play, but if it doesn't do anything, I mean, after a while, they're, they're not going to play it anymore. You yeah. know? So it's a crapshoot like anything else, but it's the only gamble that, that I do, and I just gamble on what my thoughts are in my own career. But I'm at the point now where I can do whatever I want to do. Oh, of course. And hire people to at least get some airplay and see if there's anything there. So uh, with uh, making your own uh, record company... Uh how, uh, do you have any other uh, big name artists or anybody up and coming that uh, that you're working no, I, with? I don't even have myself as a big name artist yet on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> after, us, after it does, we'll let you know. We'll have a oh. big celebration. <laughs> well, I mean, since you said you opened a record company, I thought you'd have other bands that you work with too or something like that. But. Mm -hmm. No, I'm a big enough pain in the ass on my own. That's, oh. all the only, that's the only artist I want to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I tell you what, um, there's... Oh, go ahead. No, go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, once again, thanking you for uh, letting me do this interview with you. Uh, uh, do you have a, a website that you'd like to promote or anything? No, just robparisi.com, and uh, the only thing that's on there is pictures, old pictures and stuff like that. But until you hear something on the radio, I'm always here. I'm breathing. Oh, Otherwise, cool. you'll read about it. <laughs> well, I tell you what, thanks again for uh, letting me do this interview with you. This was uh, a very rare treat, and hopefully I'll get some hits, too, because, you know, you, you are a big name, and I'm sure a lot of people remember you, know, remember you from way back in the day, and hopefully they'll remember you even now for what you're doing currently. You know? i got to tell you something. Right now I'm about this far from retiring, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had a good life. You've had a good career, and you were you gifted with the... Things are so good, you know yeah. what? But you know what? It's funny, because you can like do his chair has retired probably 65 times yeah yeah and this is only my first so i'm saying you know i got a long way to go and look at donnie he's 70 years old he's still rocking out <laughs> he does man he does he still kills he does but good for him god bless him he's got that fire you know yeah. you got it <laughs> hey some people some people do it until they until they can't do it like uh, i think george jones was on tour when he passed away so and he was 82 <laughs> Look at look at Tony Bennett. He's still out there singing his bagnolis off. Yeah, that's crazy. There's no other, you know, there's only one Tony. Yeah. he still sounds like Tony. You know, and same with Willie Nelson and all these uh, singers. It, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They don't want to retire. They just want to keep doing it. You know. So well, as long as you have it within you to be able to do it, and you feel your capacities to do it. I mean, it's like when you see somebody up on a stage and they sound not so good anymore. Yeah, they sound like they're struggling. Uh -huh. That's what makes me feel uncomfortable. Sure, but people who feel, who still have it—I mean, you only get better. Yeah, which you're doing, you know. Cool. All right. Well, I tell you what. Thanks again for letting me interview you, and uh, uh, this will be up on Sunday. So I'll let you know. Uh, I'll send it to you privately when it goes up, and then you can maybe help me promote it or something if that, if you could. <laughs> no, I put it on my page. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you very much, man. Talk My pleasure. Later. Thank you very much. And that was Mr. <laughs> Rob Parisi, uh, former lead singer of the group uh, Wild Cherry, now doing some stuff on his own, uh, doing some jazz-related material. And uh, I think, you know, how cool was that that I got a chance to talk to him anyway? I mean, it's uh, 
it's an honor to, to speak to a lot of these legendary figures because you don't know what they're going to say. I don't know half the time what I'm going to ask. It just kind of works out the way it does, and I like to improv a lot, So, and I hope they like to improv too. So it's pretty cool. I, if you guys remember Wild Cherry, which most people do, you know, go check out their music. and Go check out Rob's music if you can find it. Uh, you know, Go take a listen to it. You might like what you hear, and, uh, you know, might as well, you know, he put his effort into it. You, you might as well go take a listen to it. Anyway, I'm Frankie Slauson, and we'll see you again for another great Frankie Slauson Show uh, video. And uh, Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture Summer Interview Series will continue real soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>